everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Parks, and I'm here with Bob Morris. Bob is we're actually working on a, a multitude of projects, which he's going to tell us a bit about. Um, and, and tell us a little bit about his experience using quilter guitar amplifiers. My first question, I think the thing that's kind of you know on everyone's mind, um, what really got you into playing guitar in the first place? What was your first experience? My first experience with music was when I was about three years old. My older sisters were really into music and would always uh, put on concerts for my parents, uh, which would basically consist of them dancing with batons and stuff. And I got in on the act and I really wanted to be the drummer of Guns N' Roses. Uh, and then I asked for drums every single year until sixth grade when finally they got me uh, a drum set which I broke immediately and then they got me a guitar because it was obnoxious to have a, a boy drummer in the house. <laughs> so uh, they got me a, get a little crate, a uh, solid state amp, a uh, 15 watt amp, and I had a Samick guitar and it just went out of tune every time you strummed it but I loved playing it and I was learning all these Nirvana songs with my friends in their basement and that was pretty much what my friends and I did in middle school. Was just sat in our base in his my friend's basement and skateboarded and played guitar through the long Chicago winters. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And so you're originally from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Originally from Chicago. Um, how how did you? Uh, um, well, tell me about the kind of the first group that you got into where where there was um, you know where, where where you guys really kind of made some headway. How did that all come about? When, uh, I mean, all of my, I was always the kid who was in the band and in my schools, and around high school, uh, I was in a punk band called The Audition, which actually went on to sign with Victory Records, and lucky for me, I got to get out of the deal. Nice guys, but I just didn't, it wasn't the right band for me. It was a punk band, and I really was into that growing up, but I just decided that I wasn't uh, passionate about doing that, so I quit that band a week after we signed our contract. Uh, and then started the band with my friend Greta, who ended up who ended up being the Hush Sound. And her and I wrote a bunch of songs. And a couple weeks later, we played a show in a basement, and there was hundreds of kids because wow. the audition had already built up a Chicago fan base. And then they were like, "Oh, the guy who wrote the songs in the audition is in a new band, and it's not punk." And uh, so we played in this big basement, and it was awesome. We played. I played with a Takamine acoustic guitar, a Marshall full stack, no bass guitar, and I had. Greta just play a lot of left hand, right? <laughs> and it was probably terrible, but everybody loved it, and it was just super cool. And then we were recording an, an EP, and a week later, and by the time a week later came by, we were so inspired that we had 13 songs. So then we recorded all 13 songs, put them out, were signed a couple weeks later, and then on an arena tour a few months after that, after recording wow. our second album. Wow, that's so just it was amazing. Like, yeah, it was it was really cool. Um, and also a really great way to go on tour with catering. We're like, oh, sweet, catering, you know, like this is how touring is, that's pretty cushy. So we did that, and also the, being playing in an arena, you hit a snare drum and it goes whack, 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 whack. So we were really bad for the first few weeks. Right. Uh, playing in front of 15, 20,000 people is terrifying, but everybody, you know, you couldn't really tell that we were bad, so it was right. good. And then we got our stuff together, and after four years of touring, we you know did a bunch of headliners and played a bunch of awesome, really memorable shows, and uh, then took some time off, and now we're back making music again. We just released an EP, and now we're releasing more music. Um, we're recording more music in July. Uh, well, after our the Hush Sounds last tour, before we took a long hiatus, we went on tour with a band called One Republic. Uh, who's a huge pop band, and uh, their guitar player and I just became best friends, and uh, he's like, hey, you know, I, I live in a house with six people. It's a giant house in Hancock Park, which is this, um, like, Hasidic Jewish neighborhood, very nice, big houses uh, in Los Angeles, and he's like, we have an extra bedroom, you should come out, so I move out, I get to California after driving 36 hours straight, after just kind of being over Chicago, it was cold right. and stuff like that. I get there, and he's like, hey, Good news and bad news. Good news is we, you can stay here. Bad news is we turned your bedroom into a recording studio. Other good news is you could use that and stay here for free. I'm like, all right, so I'll sleep on the couch for a little while. So I did that for a little while and then a bedroom opened up and I, I ended up living there and we, uh, he, had, he and uh, another person, Drew, and another person had this band called Debate Team. And we got uh, Dan from OK Go to join and play drums and then I took over on bass. And uh, we released an EP, and now we're working on another EP as well, which is uh, kind of like power pop. 
music with, I would say, not comedic music, but a sense of humor. Right, right. Believe that band. Now, now you're in the midst of writing, I believe, a new album with the Hush Sound as well. Yeah, I mean, what the cool thing about music now, or the, if depending on what point of view you take on it, the really bad thing about music, but I think it's cool, is that uh, we don't feel the obligation to make an album at all. We feel an obligation to create new music that we love. And uh, the medium in which we deliver it in is pretty much, uh, you know, we're just we're just going to release songs as we want to release songs. So we're not going to release a ten song album. We're doing four or five songs, and if we're really happy with three, or you know, then we'll release three songs. Right. And if we're really happy with all five, we'll release all five songs. Being being completely independent now, after having, a, a, we were really fortunate because right before everybody started signing 360 deals, where you get a cut of merchandising and and album sales and touring and all that stuff, which pretty much is automatic now. Right. Uh, we were kind of the, like the last fleet of artists to get away with doing like a three album deal. So we did three albums, we had all the support from our record label and got on all these tours and great stuff. And then we were allowed to be completely independent now where we're completely free of our deal and have all these people who love our music so we can deliver it to them and say, hey, pay what you want. If yeah, you want to keep us cool. going, pay. If you don't, then enjoy it anyways and please spread it. Right. And do something, you know, like like with this amp, like I was glad to show it to all my friends because I was proud to play it. It's a great amp and uh, with, with our music, if you can't pay for it, you pay for it in other ways. By If you like it, then you're going to share it. So right. it's we're not worried about getting that amount of money because when you're on a record label, usually you get after you divide it by your band and you get your like 20% of what the record label gets 80% or something right. like that, you get nothing, you get so little. So now we could sell one tenth the amount of albums and make the same amount of money. So we'd rather just, if you can't pay for it, then don't pay for it, just take it. So that's, right. that's how it is. And come to the show, buy a ticket to the show. Yeah. Wow. Uh, cool. I used it the first day and I, had, I did not have it set the right way and I was not expecting how honest it can be if you want it to be, which is really great. I like to put, I like grit on mine, so I use a lot of the second channel mm -hmm. uh, with the gain about halfway up. I pretty much leave the controls of the EQ about even. Um, occasionally I'll take one notch away from the bass. One another cool thing about the amp is that it, it has notches on the EQ. So it's not some guess and check if somebody else is setting up your amp. You can, you, instead of saying halfway up, you can actually be exactly halfway up by the notches. And uh, I've noticed that if you have the bass about even or one off, it just is like still the perfect amount of fullness, but you can really control how um, muddy or not muddy it can sound and depending on the room. So right. you really can control it with very little. And the high cut is also an extremely uh, exact thing. You can you can dial it in. It's a rich rich tone, and it's exact, and it's not. It's very consistent the way that it feels, uh, and you can get you can get the consistency out of the uh, out of the amp. Now, if I remember the quote, I think um, that I saw in an email that um, I had gotten from you, it was um, something to the effect of, "It's the first time I had." ever like you know took a guitar amplifier seriously that wasn't a tube amp since you were in high school or yeah. was something to that yeah no i mean when you're a kid you know like like i said my first amp was a little uh practice amp you would call it a 15 watt solid state and then i got a bigger solid state that was 120 watts the crate with the six effects that right you yeah the R, whatever 2x12 or something and then i got my first tube amp and i thought from then on whether it was like a laney or like any type of amp i or pv or a Mesa, I just thought that meant it was better because it was more expensive. And uh, then I got really into little amps. I think after I saw Zach Wild have like eight full stacks, I decided to just go the exact opposite direction. I'm like, you know what, that's really lame. <laughs> I'm gonna get this little amp and, uh, and do the exact opposite. And so I got really into little Fender amps and they've been really cool. And I was skeptical when this was brought to me I tried it and I was just blown away not only by the rich tone but also just the built-in reverb on it is incredible. Um, I like a lot of, I use a lot of reverbs on my board as it is. I use a Verbzilla that just for an octave tone and then I use another Line 6 uh, pedal with super hard gated reverb like a ch And so to have a nice sounding long reverb at a low level 
and being able to control that, it's really, um, it's just one more thing you can do. And I always have some reverb on my guitar because it just adds that color that you right. want. So, yeah, depending on the room, I adjust pretty much around three to four of the uh, of the length. Wow. The ability to like to lock it in with with the notches it is a big deal. But also, um, sometimes um, you'll be at a concert and um, the especially I mean. I mean, most musicians are not playing stadiums. So you'll play a club where during sound check, there's this amount of energy being drawn from the circuits and stuff like that. And right. Your tubes react in a certain way. And you get it sounding good. And then when everything's happening and there's drinks being poured and everything is, uh, everything changes. All the lights are on. Everything PA's changes. On, but the, you can, the voltage yeah. sags. Yeah. The voltage sags. And with this, it, it just stays consistent and steady. And... Uh, it just sounds the way you want it to sound. You don't want to have to adjust. That's the worst when you start changing stuff on the sound guy, and he's like, what's going on? I can't tell. And he's also on all those drugs. Right, so right. You know, he's a sound guy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, so it, having that, just like locking it in and having it just sound the way it should sound is, is really such an obvious but often lacking thing in amps. And, and that's, I don't know, that's why I'm so proud to play the amp. And, that's why. Thanks, man. I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. So what, what does the future hold for Bob Morris? What are you up to next? Uh, well, like I said, we're record, uh, the Hush Sound is recording in July. Debate team is always kind of at one of our houses messing around. Uh, recording a lot, of, a lot of different genres of music and, um, I don't know, just playing music and enjoying life and, and trying to, uh, to maximize the good times, I suppose. Well, hey, everybody, uh, thanks for ch stopping in to check in with us. This is, again, Bob Morris of The Hush Sound. Uh, check him out, playing with The Hush Sound and with the debate team, and I'm sure many more projects to come. Take care. Oh,